This week, I uh, attended conference, a missions conference Thursday and Friday here in New York City. And uh, among other great things, I met, uh, not met, I, I saw one uh, person who was speaking, uh, sharing for 30 minutes. And she's a single lady, a missionary in Turkey. And uh, she ministers to Syrian refugees in Istanbul. Okay? There are, listen to me, try to focus. Yeah. 11 million Syrian refugees all over uh, the Middle East and Europe right now. 11 million. Okay? I remember going to Athens uh, many, uh, several years ago with uh, Eric, and I saw 1 million Afghani refugees in Athens. Okay? I don't know whether you could fathom that. 1 million. And they have nothing. No school, no future, no tomorrow, no job, nothing. And they have no legal residency, nothing. Basically nothing. They just migrated because they had to, because otherwise they would get killed. Those are the, uh, you know, uh, refugees. And there are 11 million. And 3 million in Turkey. 3 million. You know, we've been praying for Sudanese uh, refugees in uh, Uganda. They've been fighting for 30 years. Korea fought for three years, and the entire country was destroyed. And they've been fighting for 30 years. There's nothing. No infrastructure, no water, no electricity, no school, no nothing, basically. I mean, I could talk, go on and on and on about the refugees, but I want to talk about that lady that I saw. She's, she's, I, I think she was about 35 years old. I could be wrong, but she's a single lady uh, doing missions work in Turkey. He's, he's probably thinking, wow, you've got to be crazy. You don't even get married and you just go out to Middle East and serve to Syrian refugees? Yeah, I think she is crazy, honestly. She is crazy about Jesus, right? And it just blesses my heart. Every time I see a person like that, it blesses my heart. No, it doesn't matter what she uh, shared. She shared something great. She teaches children and feed them and, and just kind of take care of them. Uh, and 35-year-old uh, single lady serving the Lord in mid the Middle East. Uh, I was just so, so encouraged to see a person like that. I, every time I see someone like that, I get encouraged. What makes her like that? What makes someone to love and follow Christ like that? Today, uh, I want to share seventh message of following Christ. And if you're not following Christ, you're not a Christian. Okay? Sine qua non of Christianity, being a Christian, is following Christ. How do you follow Him? There's only one way you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Him. There's no other way. Okay? Make no mistake about it. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise, because that's what Jesus said. Okay? Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Okay? Today, I want to think about one person in the Scripture, and hopefully this will speak to you, because this one person is a very significant person in the Scripture. Arguably, other than Jesus, she's, he's probably the most dominant person in the New Testament, of course, right? Uh, of Jesus, leaving Jesus out. And his name is Paul. Okay? Paul. Okay. And I want to just uh, talk about his life, what kind of person he was, and how and what made him a Christian, and what kind of life he lived, and how he ended his life. That's my plan for today. Okay. So today, uh, I titled, While We Were Enemies. Okay. While We Were Enemies. And I'm going to read um, the text one more time. Uh, that our sister read, okay? Romans chapter 5, written by Paul himself, right? And I think it's sort of like, a, I, I kind of sense he's talking about himself, autobiography, sort of like, okay? Hope does not put us to shame because God's love, His great agape love, has been poured into my hearts. Okay? 
What does that look like? Let me give you a picture. It looks something like this, I think. His infinite love. This is Niagara Falls, right? From heaven to us, and then river flows. I always picture it like that. Could it be any less than this? God created this like this. Right? Could it be any less than this? So going back, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Oh, you know, I was meditating about this. God is love, and Holy Spirit is God, and He lives in us. Do you get it? God is love, and Holy Spirit is God, and He lives within us. Okay? Who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, just at the right time, perfect time, Christ died for the ungodly. God is always on time, by the way, because God is God. He's always on time. We, we tend to believe he's late, and he may be a little delayed. He's never delayed. He's always on time. Okay? Right? Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But that famous verse, uh, verse 8, but God demonstrates or shows his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we, have, we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Okay? For if we were, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, how much more? Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his love. And I uh, intentionally underlined for while we were, while we were, while we were. Do you see it? While we were weak. Okay? Which means, the word means uh, sick. While we were sick, while we were hopeless, while we were helpless. Okay? And then second while is we, while we were ungodly, which means we are godless or wicked. Okay? And the third while is while we were still sinners. Okay? Sinners, which means we are living in an opposition, complete opposition of divine will. Okay? Do you get it? Right? Rebel in disobedience. And the fourth and last is while we were enemies. Then that's my title. And enemy refers to a hater. While we hate God. He loved us. Okay? It just doesn't make sense. Okay? Our natural love uh, is toward the people who are attractive uh, in our sight. Now, think with me. Okay? I, I ask you to focus. We love the people who are attractive to us. Object of love has to be someone attractive. You don't want to marry, at least in your mind, uh, someone who's, yeah, yeah, I just, just can't love, right? You love someone who are lovable, in other words. Whatever that means. It depends on the culture. It depends on the person, person taste. But, you know, you're, if you're an American, you like supermodel looking, okay? Which is not existing, right? We're so used to that. Our natural love toward others is attractiveness or loveliness of the object of love. That's our human love. So that applies to, uh, to us, and we are constantly looking for lovable people. And that affects our relationship with God, thinking that I got to be lovable to be loved by God. Don't you think like that? It's, it's my love toward him, right, that I deserve love. That's completely opposite of God's love. Did you catch that? Our human love is always love someone who is lovable, who is skinny, thin, attractive, smart, you know, everything, right? Who is, but God is just completely opposite. It's not about the loveliness of the person, okay? And uh, God's love, the word is agape, which means uh, love, selfless, sacrificial, unconditional, 
love of God, okay? Why is it selfless? Because he gave himself for, for you, okay? Why is it sacrificial? Because he's died for you. Why is it unconditional? Because if it's conditional, you will not be, cho be chosen. That's why. And I would, add, I would add two more words. Constant. Agape love is constant. Human love is not. Okay? Human love changes. That's why people get divorced. Right? Human love changes all the time, but God's love is constant, and God's love is to the end. Unending love. Human love is not. Okay? So, that's... Uh, <clears throat> That's agape love. And if that's how he loves us, we have no hope. And Charles Hodge explains it this way. And this is pretty convincing if you can listen to this. God loves us because, uh, if God loved us because we loved him, we would, uh, he would love us only as long as we love him, which makes sense, right? That's human love. And on that condition, and then our salvation would depend on constancy of our treacherous or fickle hearts. Okay? That would be disastrous. As long as we love him, he's going to love us. That will be disastrous. But he loves us as God loved us as sinners. Okay? As Christ died for us ungodly, our salvation depends, as the apostle argues, not on our loveliness, but on the constancy of the love of God. Okay. Isn't that great? Okay. If it is depends on my love toward him, it'll be disastrous. But his love toward me and the salvation is not depends on my loveliness, but his constancy of his love. God is constant. Right? Hmm. I, I, you know, this week I was thinking about this, uh, and uh, this is amazing. Do you meditate upon uh, love of God? Do you ever meditate upon love of God? You should do that. That's Christianity. That's what it means to live a Christian life. That's what the Holy Spirit does when, if the Holy Spirit is working in you. You think about His mercy and love. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why we read right here, right here. Right? Holy Spirit has been given to us, and He pours His love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Let me just explain something. Christianity is about Christ died, which is a significant message. Who is Christ? The Creator and God Almighty. And he's going to consummate. He's going to be the judge. Christ died is Christian message. But it does not end there. Christ died for you. That's the Christian message, isn't it? Christ died for you. Why? The natural question has to be why. And the answer to that is because he loves you. That's the Christian message. Could you think about that? Okay? Christ died is the Christian message. And the message does not end there, but Christ died for you. Why? Because he loves me. I think it gets even greater crazy uh, message if we are sinners and enemies and ungodly and weak. And that's who we are. Okay? It is not about the attractiveness of the object of love, but it is, his love is toward complete opposite. I know this is not a best example, but I have to use this illustration. Can you imagine uh, Hillary and Donald Trump doing a debate, and one hates, but one loves? Can you imagine the debate? What would that debate look like? Right? I don't know whether you guys watched it. Right? And imagine... One continue to attack and try to destroy. One continue to pull out the messiness of, of his, his life or her life. We just continue to do that. And the other person try to cover. Can you imagine doing that? doing that? One is hate and let's say one is love. That's exactly how God loved us. Can you imagine that? Right? We hate, we are haters, enemies. But he loved us. It's crazy if you think about it. And imagine that debate, the okay, fourth debate. 
at Long Island University, okay, or St. St. John's, okay? And it's going to be one will be hating the other opponent, and the other person agapeing, loving the other person. Can you imagine the debate look like? But that's exactly what Christian story is. We hated him. We were rebels, and we try to uh, go exactly opposite of what he desires, but he loved me. Would you stay with me with that? Have you ever seen anything like it? Is there anything like that? And the crazy thing about this God's love is according to Augustine, he loves you as if there is only one of you in this world. Okay? I know you can't really feel this. You know, I think the best illustration is those who are, your, who are parents. You have two kids. You have three kids. Let's say you have four kids. Okay? Do you love your children or child 25% at a time of your love? No. You can't do that. Right? Even the human, human beings. I have three children. I don't divide my love toward 33%, 33%, 33.333% 33 for the third one. I don't do that. I do as best as I can, right? Try to love 100%, 100%, 100%. Even a human being, wicked human being, with limited love, I strive to do that. Can you imagine God who is infinite love? towards you doing that right god loves each and every one of us as if there is only one of us and the condition of his love towards you there is none he just chose to love you i thought about this okay um paul was a bad person right he was an enemy of Christ. He literally was, which we're going to look at together. But God chose him before the foundation of the world. So he knew he was going to be bad, and then he was going to be the chosen instrument. Did he, did he not know that in, in terms of time, right? God, who is transcendent of time, in his mind, already this bad person is a child of God. That's God. That's God's love. We don't think like that. We don't. He's my enemy. He's my, you know, enemy. He's a bad guy. We think like that in chronological time, time, time zone. But God already knew. He knew Paul's sinfulness and depth of his sin, and yet he still loved him and have chosen him as a uh, chosen instrument. Isn't that kind of crazy? That's God's agape love towards you. Okay, I, wanna, I want us to uh, go to uh, Acts 9, quickly go over, okay, uh, <laughs> this picture is from uh, movie AD, those of you who have a chance to see this, you should watch this, this is about uh, Book of Acts, uh, came out a few years ago, excellent, excellent, this is Paul, and he's a vicious guy, he's a Pharisee, and he is very strong-willed, is determined to exterminate all the Christians, followers of, of Nazarene. Okay? He's determined to kill the church. So he's the enemy of the church, and he was the enemy of God. And Acts 9 begins like this. Okay? Saul, that's his name before his conversion. Would you picture with, it, with me? This Saul, right? He was breathing threats and murder against the disciples or the followers of the Lord. Can you, that's how it begins, okay? That's where he was. Not only he was a, you know, sort of like a bad guy, I hate Christians, but he was breathing out, breathing out murder, murderous threats. Do you do that to anyone? You don't, right? But this guy so hated Christians and, and, and followers of Christ, Christ so much, he was breathing out like a war horse after running a uh, three-mile run in a cold weather. He was breathing out. Can you imagine? Right? That <laughs> breathing out 
I gotta kill those Christians. That's the picture. Okay? He was no neutral person. He was no nice person, right? He was breathing out threats and murders against Christians. So he went to the high priest and he got the permission and authority to kill and arrest and bring them bring back to Jerusalem. What hap- what's gonna happen to them if they come back to Jerusalem? They will be Uh, they'll go on a trial and basically put to death. He wanted to kill everybody, literally. Now he went on his way. So he went on his way to Damascus. He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Okay, that's the story. And when it happened... Saul falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, he fell from a horse, and this is the enemy of Christians and Christ. I don't know why God shines light upon him. It doesn't make sense. I don't know why he talks to him. Would you talk to him if he's that kind of an enemy to you? The first chance you get, you shoot and kill. Enemy is supposed to be killed. Otherwise, you get killed, right? But God approached him, Saul, Saul, like a weak person. Why are you persecuting me? Right? Why are you persecuting me? And then he said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, right? Who are you? And then God said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Do you hear it? Why talk to him? What do you mean you're persecuting Jesus? Right? He was persecuting the Christians, but Jesus is saying, you're persecuting me. And I think this is very insightful. Okay? You persecute God's people, you're persecuting God himself and Christ. Right? And then he said to Paul, rise and enter the city and you will be told what you, what you are to do. In other words, God already orchestrated, already planned how he's going to live. He already prepared other person named Ananias and rest of his life. And he's telling, just go to that city and wait for my uh, instruction. So the man, and, but, but the man who are traveling with him, the people around him stood speechless hearing the voice but see no one nobody knew what was going on they're hearing the voice but nobody knew what was going on so Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened and he saw nothing you know what happened when he met Christ so interesting his eyes were opened but they saw nothing so insightful your eyes opened but maybe you still, you see nothing where do you see that John chapter 3, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. People think that seeing is after you die you and, and, and enter into it. No, 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 no. Right now, you do not see any kingdom of God unless you're born again. You're blind. Your eyes opened. You see nothing, though. Okay? Where am I? Although there are, he, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Okay, and three days he was without sight and he did not eat nor drink. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Do you see what's going on? Just to save that kind of enemy and wretch, he prepares another person. Doesn't he do that in Acts chapter 10 too? With Cornelius and Peter? Doesn't he do that with Philippian jailer and Paul? Doesn't he do that with Lydia and Paul? Doesn't he do that? Doesn't he do that? He's doing that right now. He orchestrates the history and the lives of his people so that his purpose will be fulfilled and your life will be in order according to what he has planned. That's who God is, right? Lord said to him, rise to Ananias, go to the street called Straight, and at the house Judas, uh, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. And behold, he's praying, okay? He made Paul to pray, and he let Ananias have a dream, okay, or vision. 
And he has seen a vision. In other words, Paul already has seen a vision. A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. You know, God orchestrates everything, right? But Ananias kind of like, no, 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 Lord. He's a, I heard he's a pretty bad guy. And, you know, he's a dangerous guy. He has the authority from the chief priest to kill everybody. And listen to this. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is my chosen instrument. Okay? Love of God. Okay? He's my chosen instrument. You know, this has got to be the biggest qu question we must have in Christianity. There are millions of people. Right? Millions of people. But why God chooses someone who is so atrociously wicked and enemy of God himself. You know why? There's no reason. That's his love towards you. There's no reason. It's just his love towards you. His unconditional, selfless, sacrificial, constant, infinite love towards you. He's my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I'll show you how much he must suffer from the sake of my name. Ananias, Ananias obeyed then. He departed, went into the house, laying his hands on him. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you might regain your sight, so that you may be able to see, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who is Holy Spirit? God. Enemy filled with God. Do you see the grace? Do you see the love of God? And immediately something like scales fell from the eyes. Okay, I think I love this part. Okay, your eyes open you, and you can't see anything. You cannot see the kingdom of God because something like scale is covering your eyes. And that fell. Now you began to see. Scripture, right? Now you began to see. Okay. And he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized. Take food and he was strengthened. And look at this. I intentionally added this. And immediately, what did he do? Immediately, when his eyes were opened, immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, this is a story. Now, for those of you who know about this story, it's in the, right in the middle of the book of Acts. Book of Acts is like a history of Christian church, early church. It should carry the big pictures. Okay? Jerusalem, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and church was birthed. 5,000 people came to know the Lord. And, you know, church is expanding. There's a persecution. And people are telling Christ about everywhere. And all of a sudden, it zooms in on one person. Or someone who is not even worthy to be, to be mentioned. His first appearance, Paul's appearance, is in Acts, Acts 7, when Stephen was killed, being killed. Stoned to death, okay? And what was he doing? He was just gathering uh, the outer garments. And that's how, that's, that was his debut. That's how he showed up in the scripture. An idiot. Vicious guy. Enemy. Right? And Acts chapter 8 is about, mainly about Philip and how gospel go forth. And all of a sudden, it just stops and zoom in on one person. You know why? Because God loves you as if there is only one of you. That's why. And I think about why Paul. Why such uh, elevate the name of Paul, the greatness of Paul. I don't think that's why. I think the reason is not to elevate the name of Paul. It's to elevate the love of God towards someone like Paul. Do you understand? While I was 
sinners, enemies, weak, ungodly. Christ died for me. And that's the love of God. You know why Paul followed? That love of God. And I, I shared last week, you are not, your life will not be changed by quitting smoking. Those of you who smoke, don't try to quit. Oh, that sounds very bad. I quit, quit, yeah. But quitting smoking will not change your life. No. Because if you quit smoking, you will go into, I don't know, marijuana or something. Something else. Because your heart longs for something to satisfy your heart. It's not about quitting on the outside. Only way your life would, will be completely changed is when you, are, when you experience an unexplainable great love of something towards you. Because that love has, has the expulsive power to remove that is everything that is so inferior to that. When you see a great thing, everything, will, everything else will subside. That's how it works. You know why we cannot follow Christ? I shared this last week. Because you do not see it. Okay, because there is a scale in your eyes. People, would you open your eyes? You say, it is open. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Koreans have a small eyes. Okay? Open your eyes. You can't see. You know why? Because there's a scale in your eyes. Scripture, Scripture. That's why you can't follow. That's why Christianity is at best mediocre. Coming to church is always difficult. That's why. Because unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Because if you see it, there's nothing like it. There's nothing, nothing greater. Right? I ask you to look at this picture one more time. Uh, I love this picture. Those of you who uh, haven't been to Niagara Falls, uh, I love Niagara Falls. I remember going to Niagara Falls years ago for like two days or something. And then on the last day, uh, I took an elevator from the elevate, uh, from, you know, fall level to the river level. And then I saw the river that flows after the waterfall. I don't know whether you've ever seen it. That torrent, right? That just, that raging river flowing. And I was so excited about that. And I told my wife, let's stay one more day. I want to spend a little more time here. Let's just stay one more day. And we did. Okay, I always win, right? Yeah, and let's just stay one more day. When the love of God flows from above, the waterfall flows. I always think of God's love as waterfall. There's got to be a river flowing in your life. Do you know why you're, there is no love and there is no joy? Because of sin and disobedience. That's how it works. Okay? Sin and disobedience. And, you know, uh, sometimes we talk about, when, when we look at people, we kind of get a little bit worried because it seems like he's losing his joy. Are you like that? Losing your joy. You know why? seems like yeah, it's just not there. Joy is not there. You know why? This is how it works. When sin and disobedience blocks and separates, you don't feel the love of God, and you do not have any love for God. It makes sense, right? When sin and uh, disobedience just kind of like dominates your life, you don't feel the joy of the Lord, and you don't have any joy toward the Lord. Does that make sense? If the Holy Spirit lives in you, the greatest message of Christianity is that we were enemies like Hillary and, I, I shouldn't say that, Hillary and Donald Trump, their opponents, they're just pointing fingers at each other, try to, I don't think they try to build each other up, do you think? Right? They just, I don't know, they pull out the deep things, messy things, ugly things, and sit in their lives, they try to kill each other. But Christianity is, when we try to do that to God, He loved me. 
as Christian love. And he has chosen me to be the chosen instrument to proclaim the name of, name of God to the Gentiles and kings and, and the people of Israel. That's Christian agape love. You know why Paul followed to the end? Because of that great love, Holy Spirit reigning in his heart. There's only one way you're going to follow Christ. It has to be that great love toward wretch like you, like me. Because that love will compel you to follow him. Can you look at this picture? Okay. Billy Graham said, God demonstrated or showed and proved his love on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. I love you this much. Come here. Yeah, I love you. Would you look at me? Come on, people. This is the Christian message. I love you. God speaking to you. How much? This much. Christ died, and Christ died for you. That much. How much? This much. Why? Because I love you. Why? Because I love you. Why? God loves each, each, each of us as if there is only one of us. In this great city, Augustine says, He loves you as if there is only one of you. Just like Paul, right? Out of history is opening up, and all of a sudden it stops and zoom in on one person named Saul who deserved nothing but the wrath of God, according to his own words. Right? You know, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, and I love this uh, ending. It's like the pinnacle of uh, Romans, Romans chapter 8. Okay? And then Paul him, himself asked this rhetorical questions. Okay? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? If God justifies me through the blood of his son, who's going to condemn me? If God loves me, what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Three rhetorical questions, meaning there's nothing. And then he shares his conviction. For I know, for I'm convinced, nothing, including life or death, angels nor demons, present nor the future, or anything else, height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. How do you know? If God did not spare his own son and he died for me, would he spare anything? That's his argument. Do you understand? Will you follow him? Now, don't turn your eyes, uh, you know, away from me right now. You have to look at me. Will you follow him? Or is it going to be a joke for the rest of your life? Come on. Your life hangs on it. Your eternity hangs on it. That's how it is. His great love toward you. You know why we don't feel joy? We don't feel love? Because of sin and disobedience and your rebellion. You don't feel the love of God toward you. You don't feel the love of God toward Him. A love of yourself toward Him. That's a sad place to be. I want to finish with this picture. Picture. 
This is the love of God. How do you, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid that, people? This is the love of God. Could it be anything smaller than this? He created the Niagara Falls like this. Like this. Christ died, and Christ died for you because he loves you. I want to tell that story to you. Okay? Let's pray.